Hi guys, I'm Lara Satraki and I'm hosting our weekly Syria Saturday Hangout. It's a conversation where we come together as journalists to talk about the crisis in Syria and try to get the headlines to make more sense. It's part of our initiative, Syria Deeply, to bring together journalists and technologists to find new ways to explain the crisis. We have a great group of people together today. Mike Downs is with us from the UK. He is a grandmaster of Google Hangouts. We're extremely lucky to have him with us. He's a teacher, he's a broadcaster, he's done more than 1,600 Hangouts, and he's going to help us really try to amp it up as we show you what we've been watching this week. Also with us, Christy Wilcox from Istanbul. She's a freelance journalist. She's been reporting fantastic uh, insights from the Syrian-Turkish border over the past weeks and months. Uh, we also have Mohammed Sergi, our senior editor at Syria Deeply, a seasoned reporter with Dow Jones uh, and multiple publications covering the Middle East. And Satanik Mirzoyan, uh, one of our campus uh, helpers. She's been organizing uh, campus awareness efforts around the Syria crisis. She's currently a student at the University of Michigan. So jumping right in from there, the first thing we wanted to show you was a, was a photo that we picked up on that was originally on the Washington Post website. It was a Polaris photo, an incredible shot of rebel fighters in the city of Aleppo. That's Syria's biggest city. It's been the scene of its fiercest battles, and it continues to be a place we're watching very closely. Mohammed and I worked on a piece uh, that's going to be on Syria Deeply called Why Battle for Aleppo? Why is it so important? Because it basically represents uh, the, key, the key factor for control of Syria's north. Uh, so Mike's trying to put up that picture for you guys to see. We have rebel fighters and, and light streaming it around them. Um, and how's that working out? Yeah, that's already gone. And, we, we've already shown it as you were talking, Laura. Yeah. Uh, and from there, essentially, we're looking at the ceasefire that was declared officially on Friday. Within hours, it broke down. You had the UN going in to try to negotiate some sort of reprieve for the four days of the Muslim Eid al-Adha holiday. Uh, the government agreed to it. That there's that picture there showing up on your screen. Those rebel fighters. So uh, we're looking at the ceasefire as a as a kind of uh, example, a kind of case study into why this conflict is so hard to solve. You have rebel fighters who don't trust the regime. The regime doesn't trust rebel fighters. They both sort of agreed to this ceasefire within hours. There was clashes. Uh, there were renewed reports of fighting and now reports of around 150 people who've died since. Um, so we're looking at that as a sort of example of why this is such a hard conflict to solve. Uh, in that same amount of time, where we see uh, accusations lobbed back and forth as to why the ceasefire didn't work. Uh, so on that, let's toss to Mohammed. Mohammed, you're watching this closely. I mean, what really stuck out for you in the past 24 hours? Well, one of the most important things that came out of the ceasefire, um, and this has happened before when the Arab League observers came and the uh, UN observers came and there was also a short ceasefire with, with Kofi Annan is that you see the return of peaceful protests and that signifies that the essence of the Syrian revolution, the Syrian movement is demonstrating against the dictatorship of Assad and when we see them come out in their thousands we understand that the desire of the people is really to come out and do this in a way where they where they don't have to kill and they don't have to die. On the other hand, uh, if we go back to the picture from Aleppo, that is in, a, in an area called Karmel Jabal, which is um, in the old in the old city, and it's been under the hands of uh, under the control of the rebels for a while now, and they're trying to push out. The day before the ceasefire began, the day before Eid, um, rebel fighters went into two uh, two Christian neighborhoods and one uh, Kurdish neighborhood and also into sort of a, a, a business district called uh, uh, Faisal, Faisal, King Faisal Street and they went to the to, this, to a grand mosque, an uh, important mosque called the Rahman Mosque. These were small groups but the fact that they were able to get in to what were supposed to be secured areas really really brought to question how much how how much of a control of the city does, does the government have at this point. If the rebels are able to come into the, to their centers of power, a lot of analysts, including Joshua Landis, who uh, who looks at this very closely, is belie believes now that Aleppo is slipping out of control. I know there were some reports that the rebels made it into Christian neighborhoods. The BBC reporting that happened. I was also hearing it from sources uh, that that had happened. How significant is that? There, 
Okay, the, the the importance of these neighborhoods is not because they're Christians. It's because it's because they are they're first of all not in control of the rebels, so they want to take they want to have control of them, and they're also um, they are they're also the base for uh, for military intelligence, uh, the political intelligence of Aleppo in, in the uh, in the Syrian neighborhood. So th these are the areas where the the government, the regime soldiers, um, launch their attacks on the other parts of the city. It does. I, I don't. I don't really believe at this point that uh, that these are that, that they're attacking them because they're Christian. And uh, if we look at if we look at Aleppo for the past almost three months now, there hasn't been a single massacre of Christian, of Christian children, families, women. There are there of course Christians who have died, but they weren't targeted as a group. So we can look at that as a as a positive point. But it's still very concerning to people who see. Um, who see fighting happening in their neighborhoods, and they and you know that's a very uh, troublesome sign. So it's this fact that these were regime strongholds that these neighborhoods in particular hadn't been under rebel control. Now they're making advances, uh, and that's strategically significant. Christy, you, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. But in in our piece, in our piece of, on Syria deeply about about the Battle of Aleppo, the the main idea behind it is that they want to take control of the economic and industrial center of Syria. And the way to do that is to attack the regime strongholds wherever they are. So this is their strategy and they will continue on it until they're successful or they die. That's what the rebels say. Christy, you were reporting from the border on families trying to celebrate Eid, trying to have a normal holiday. What's the sentiment there? And what do people say also about this military element, this question of military force versus peaceful protests. What do you pick up on down there? Muted. So un unmute yep. yourself, Christy, sorry. Christy's unmuted. <laughs> okay, let me, try that. let me try that again, sorry about that. Um, you know, I, I've been on both sides of the borders, the border this week, and unfortunately, the the sentiment towards the celebration is there's really no celebration. I mean, they're just the people have been very distraught, and um, I've talked to both business owners, I've talked to um, refugees, and the business owners are struggling because, of course, you know before they used to go into areas like Aleppo to get their you know their ingredients uh, bring things back to their shops they can no longer do that so they're spending more gas money more time going to areas where um, you know it's it's better for them and, and safer for them but they can't cross a lot of them cannot cross the, the border into Turkey which they used to do I mean they used to bring a lot of business into Turkey. Now there are certain cities in Turkey that, that just don't want to have anything to do with the, the uh, what's going on in Syria anymore. They don't want to help the refugees. And there are other cities that are very, very friendly towards these people and saying, hey, we'll take you in. We'll, you know, we're, we're going to give you a new place and a home. So it really depends on where you're at. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it's a, a matter of confrontation or people, you know, welcoming them. Why can't is, they cross is that, the border? Is that a, uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, I think you know, with one hundred and five thousand refugees, I'm trying to. Why can't they cross the border? Um, Turkey has taken as many refugees as they they can. You know, they've they've said, you know, we're kind of maxed out in that regard, and. Um, so they're either keeping people, they're pushing people back who are ending up in the, the smaller refugee camps on the side, or they're ending up staying in cities where they're displaced. So they just can't, you know, cross back and forth. Um, I think Turkey's become very uncomfortable with, with letting everybody and anybody cross through the border. They want to know who's coming. Mohammed, you are Yeah, I just wanted to ask Chrissy uh, if you could explain a bit about the, the differences in, in the uh, in the sectarian and ethnic makeup of these border regions in Turkey and why some regions are not are not uh, more supportive of uh, taking in these refugees than others are okay um, yeah I mean well okay so so the president um, who is Alawite uh, the the town of Antakya is is primarily an Alawite town um, a lot of them are pro uh, Sada uh, uh, supporters. And, you know, a lot of them are just anti-American, anti-imperialism. I mean, every party has their own reason for uh, either supporting the regime or not really supporting the rebels' actions. So you're seeing a lot of riots in, in the small town of, of Antakya. 
Now, in Kilis, where I've been more recently, um, you don't see the sectarian like separation as much um, because I've been in you know I've been in clinics there where uh, there are a lot of Sunnis, um, there are other sects, and they're they're letting these people come in and get you know the 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 um, doctors that they need. They've opened clinics. They've they've allowed them to come into their city and and actually started a life. They're trying to open a little school actually too in uh, Achilles for Syrian families who are displaced. So, so um, those are the two. Yeah. Go ahead. No, that's interesting. So basically, you're seeing a distinct difference in how these refugees are received, even in terms of material help, based on the sectarian makeup of those border towns in, in Turkey, it sounds like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's very, very clear, um, depending on which town you're in, uh, which way they're, you know, directed one way or the other. I mean, whether they're accepted there or not, and which which way they're pushing towards as well. And not to say that every, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to single it out and say that, you know, there's definitely both sides of the story in each one of those towns, but you can tell which way that each town pushes towards. So pulling back to this question of the ceasefire uh, and this important point that even if it didn't lead to an end in violence, that at least it allowed for some cover for these protests to reemerge, for people to come out in thousands across Syria to prove that they've been pushing for this kind of peaceful reform. Uh, we pulled up a video actually sent to us by Donatella Del Rada, uh of the protesters in the streets. I think Mike was going to show us some of them. And they're singing and they're dancing. There are even uh, drum players. My favorite is these trumpeteers playing music in the streets uh, with black ski masks on. <laughs> so you kind of still have this sense that it's wartime and there's danger. But people are festive. It's a carnival atmosphere. And they just seem grateful to be able to turn out. Uh, I mean, Mohammed, what's the significance of that? Do they feel like they have to find every opportunity to make noise, essentially? It, it, it is definitely that. And, and uh, there's a, a real a deep desire for regular Syrians who, the vast majority of which, haven't carried arms. That's just, we don't have millions of people in the Free Syrian Army or the regular army. Most people are peaceful, they don't, want to, they don't want to go and die or kill, but they still want to have their voices heard. And this, this allows them that opportunity. The, um, the significance of it is, uh, is very important. And you, know, you, see, you see people with, their, with, with face masks on and, and the, uh, the danger of, uh, of coming in and, um, and exposing themselves to the, to the regime and their informants. So that, that fear still exists. But on the other hand, a lot of people have Long, long, uh, long, crossed that wall of fear, and are now and are now ready to go out and demonstrate. The thing that I heard over and sorry, no, go on, go on. Uh, I was going to say the thing that I heard over and over um, when I was inside uh, Syria was that it was really important um, for these families to allow their kids and children to be kids to be able to celebrate and participate in the holiday without feeling like, you know, they're going to, something negative is going to happen. So I think they just wanted to be able to, to give them that opportunity with the ceasefire. Christy, did those refugees on the border want to protest? Were they expressing a political message as well, or were they just focused on day-to-day -day life? I think they were more focused on day-to-day -day life. I mean, that's what I gathered. I've talked to quite a few refugees on, on the Syrian side. Um, I guess they're more displaced. And it seemed to me like they, they just wanted to figure out, okay, how are we going to survive? They're worried we're going to have to stay here until the end of the war, <laughs> was what I was hearing from some people. And uh, on top of that, they're going into the winter months. So they're worried about, you know, blankets and food and, and just, you know, pretty much how to survive. Such an I actually have a, another point to make on this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's one that's um, yeah, no, just, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask uh, for for the Syrian rebels or for the Syrian refugees who are finding difficulty going into Turkey. For the other bordering countries in Syria, what is their are they more inclined to allow more more of the refugees in? For example, Lebanon or with the with all the clashes in Lebanon. What's the situation with the other bordering countries? 
just to kick it off, I know in Lebanon and, and Jordan in particular, it's a very different situation in the fact that a lot of the refugees, so to speak, are coming into urban areas and setting up life there. It's not so much a question of whether there are camps and they're now overflowing. Uh, so, but you know, you have the international community calling on all of these countries to give these refugees a warmer welcome. Uh, we've heard resistance from Iraq. We had a Human Rights Watch with us a few hangouts back saying that Iraq isn't doing its part to receive refugees uh, from Syria. And in general, Jordan is saying that they don't have the resources to accommodate everybody. So even, uh, even if they're letting them in, right now, the, in the Zaatari refugee camps, we have people contributing to Syria deeply who say there's very little electricity, very little services, very little security for women and children. Uh, so even if they're being let in, there are all sorts of struggles that they're facing. Iraq, it's ironic because so many Iraqi refugees came to Syria during the war there and now human rights activists saying Iraq isn't giving them the same courtesy as they come out, uh, which is really some, something very telling. Mike's just put up a map of the region. One of the things that we wanted to do on this hangout was put up that map so we just get a sense of how these ripple effects are affecting the neighbors. Uh, of course, there's been that fighting in Lebanon. Uh, there's the bombing of Wissam al-Assad, a key security figure. Uh, and, and you can see we're, we're kind of charting the bubbles of people as they flow uh, to each country and the heavy, heavy burden that each of these countries is facing. Jordan had a soldier killed in cross-border clashes in the past stretch. Uh, and so this is already the worst case scenario playing out. Uh, that map also, to kind of just show you, you see Aleppo kind of right on the northeast there. I don't know if it's, so we can zoom in enough for you to see. But this fighting, this whole northern region, uh, of Syria that, and that's seeing so much of the fight now is, you know, a direct spillover to Turkey, northern Lebanon, uh, Iraq. So this is a very, very localized thing. Mohammed, uh, do you want to jump in? What were you going to say earlier before I cut you off? Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. I just actually, the, the peaceful protests themselves are, are work as a segue for us uh, for the tensions between the different oppo opposition groups. So we have, on the one hand, the armed rebels and the uh, the infiltration of foreign fighters and extremist Islamic extremists, uh, uh, Salafists, and perhaps even Al Qaeda, and then you have, on the other hand, the much larger group of people who want to come out and and do this peacefully. So this this shows us how complex the situation is in Syria and uh, how violence will, you know, eventually remove these voices from from the scene. And that is a big fear for both the revolution and for. Um, the people who care about the country and seeing stability and, and perhaps a unified Syria in the end. So it's almost the armed revolution versus the peaceful revolution. In some in some ways, yes. But uh, the the, uh, the I'll I'll let you go, Chrissy, in a second. But just to to be to be completely clear on this, the uh, peaceful protesters from perhaps over a year ago have been calling for military foreign intervention, no uh, no fly zones, um, arming the Free Syrian Army. All of, all of these things. So they, they, they are linked in many ways. It's just not all of them are carrying arms. And Chris, Chris, do you want to um, You know, that's what I was going to say is uh, at first, you know, I thought, okay, maybe the ceasefire will work. I mean, I, I had a positive feeling about it, even though I felt like, okay, maybe this won't last for very long. Um, and with uh, the people, you know, coming in and having their own peaceful protests, obviously it got interrupted by, you know, down in places like Homs and Hama, you know, you're having car bombs, that kind of stuff, um, who, you know, that has injured and, and killed people, um, have turned those situations around. And yes, now we're seeing a lot of situations where it's not, you know, it's not rebels, but it's um, the influx of other um, what they would call, I guess, terrorists or um, foreign fighters uh, who have come in and, and kind of disrupted that that peaceful protest. Mike, you were nodding earlier when Mohammed was talking. What was on your mind? Um, well, just just agreement as well. And I, I think it's for me. It's uh, let me just go to the map and show show something here because um, this is something that I keep going on about. And I was talking to Christy about the other day, and that is that for me is the and I, I claimed to Lara earlier on that I know absolutely nothing about Syria, and I, I'm getting to know, you know. And, and sort of Lara thankfully disagreed and said you do know something. 
if you can look where my, my mouse pointer is from, this Syrian border is about, what is it, 560 miles long between uh, Syria and Turkey. And so the distance between here and down to the coast here, that border, is the same distance as it from New York until to Charleston or from Scotland until the south of France. And when and what I get is like Syria have done this, Turkey have done that. And then the next thing, um, you know, you, it's not like you can like drive down there in a Jeep in a day and have a little look around you know just to, to for the for the west to really understand what's going on and i've got another fact here the syrian civil war on wikipedia is eleven thousand seven hundred and seven words long which is forty five pages and if you read it out loud it would take you an hour and nineteen minutes of reading and that's the bit where i hopefully come in to try and simplify these things because people i just think get lost absolutely can we put that map back up yeah of yeah. course so what Christy and I and Mohammed certainly have been looking at is, as journalists is how do we reach Aleppo these days? So if you look at that knob over Achilles and you look at Aleppo, normally that's about a 30 minute drive. Mm -hmm. um, what you have now is it has gotten so dangerous and especially in the past few weeks, this really got to me, this didn't get much attention in the press. Since so much of this area is now rebel controlled, the regime has launched a campaign to essentially take it back uh, and launch very, very heavy air power against that whole region. They're using these things called barrel bombs, which are basically explosives dropped from the sky. It's something Mohammed pointed out to us again and again, not to, not to ignore. Cluster bombs, I mean, it's gotten extremely fierce up there. And I've got the, we've got the driving directions. We're getting close enough to see the, the driving directions, um, which is great. But, uh, you know, this swings us well into the topic that we wanted to hit today, really as the bullseye, which is, so the ceasefire wasn't exactly a ceasefire. So what is it really good for? We're touching on the protests themselves, right? That the fact that they were about, allowed to come back out. Uh, another thing we've been looking at, Mohammed and I this week, are the full panorama of opposition players, right? So you've got the Syrian National Council outside the country trying to come together, the National Coordination Bureau inside the country trying to muster some, some traction, the UN trying to pull together a negotiation track uh, does this ceasefire really help re restart that momentum? And, and really, what's going to be the end effect uh, of, of the fact that you declared a ceasefire, it didn't really work? Does that help this move forward, or does it mean that we're just stuck in the mud? Mo, what do you think? I, I honestly have no, no idea where it's going to go from here, but uh, I'm, I, I was pretty pessimistic that the ceasefire would hold uh, or the truce, as they're calling it, uh, it's a it's a short term uh, cessation in uh, in violence. The both sides believe that they can win and uh, win militarily and uh, win by force. So they will continue on until until you know, either they're exhausted or or victorious. <laughs> it's it's a sad situation. Christy, your assessment? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to say. I, I think unfortunate, you know, at first I felt, okay, maybe this will work this time. It hasn't worked any other time. Um, but it's hard to say where it's going to go from here. I mean, the one thing that I thought was if, if this ceasefire were to um, actually work, that at the end of the four days, and, and we may still see this, that the fighting is even going to get more intense because all it's going to do is help either the rebel side or the regime side prepare for bigger, heavier, more fighting. So it's it's hard to say what's going to happen after this. Mike, I know you're watching it really as a news consumer and a news analyst um, and a broadcaster on Google. I mean, does it feel like you're just watching the same show on repeat? I think for me, it's I, I liken it, and it's it's not any anything at all. But being being British with the Northern Ireland conflict, and that is that so much is thrown at you from you know since I was a child all the way to even now, that you get to this level where you can't take it anymore. You know, you're so punch drunk with the information. So I said this to some other uh, news organisations a couple of weeks ago. I said. How, how do you make sense of it all? And one of the reporters who had just come back from Syria said, yeah, there's about four stories or, or more a day. And for me, all I'm looking at to do is to break something down to make it simple and to know where people, you know, go. Cause, you know, it's almost like for me seeing a load of parts scattered all over the floor. And if somebody said, look, go and build something with it, I couldn't. So I have to bring it down. So going back to, say, the ceasefire, I, I was thinking about Syria Tracker and about how many martyrs lose their life every single day, which goes from, what is it, about 100 to 250 a day. So I'm thinking, well, how can I really say whether the ceasefire is working or not? Maybe getting my daily email to see 
well, let, let's look at a trend that this figure's got to go down, and I'd only be happy when it's zero, of course. Absolutely, a kind of data visualization, uh, which mm. SiriaTrack has been great for, and we're definitely looking to them and trying to figure out what we can do to help that along. Satani, do you have a question you want to toss in? Um, I was just wondering, for, for in order to have a ceasefire that would hold perhaps more international cooperation among people who are involved, or among countries that are involved in the conflict, to have more of a kind of consensus of not arming either side in order to have more pressure for them to actually stick to their ceasefire for fear of not being able to continue fighting if the ceasefire wouldn't hold. Mo, do you think that's remotely possible? I think I think it's a great idea and and uh, would definitely solve the problem. But what we have is a a, a split in the uh, Security Council, and we're not going to see China and Russia. Will Russia primarily um, stop or at least in, in install any sanctions or or uh, or uh, an arms ban uh, an arms ban on uh, on Syria? So it's 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 sort of a moot point. So when you have Iran sending soldiers in, Hezbollah having uh, fighters dying inside of Syria. That has been proven. The other side of the equation, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and, and, and some Western countries will look at this and see intervention happening, and it's just going to continue. So but I do have a question for a second. Yeah. And in terms of the uh, campus uh, organization activism that you're doing, I was wondering, uh, what do you see, um, uh, how do you see uh, the engagement from students, and, uh, and how do they view this conflict, and how do you view it? A lot of the students I've spoken to are just they. A lot of the I've spoken to a lot of people of Arab descent, of Syrian descent, particularly. They're all. It seems that they all feel the same as the international community. Of they know that something's going on. They're not exactly quite sure what to do to help it. What to do um, to to solve the problem that is going on in Syria right now. Um, there is definitely a lot of interest in finding out ways that the international community and students themselves can what they can do to help find a solution or to assist the um, refugees in any way that they can. General helplessness. I keep looking down because I'm checking Twitter. We're getting a bunch of comments in on the hashtag Syria Saturday. And there's one question that I think Mo and Christy could definitely feel, which is, you know, is Syria, is a future free Syria, what are, what are they going to do with the more extremist fighters who've now taken root. You know, this fight's gone on for more than 19 months. In that time, you have foreign fighters, some of them Al-Qaeda-linked groups, some of them homegrown extremist groups like the Nusra Front, uh, taking part in this fight. They're now part of this soup of rebel fighters, this loose network of, of militias fighting against the Assad regime. Uh, are they growing in prominence? And what's going to happen to them after this fight is over? Is the future free Syria going to have to fight these extremist groups to get them out of their country. Mo, what do you think? I think I think absolutely that there will be a there will be a, a battle as we saw in Iraq uh, of the Sunnis themselves against uh, against the Al Qaeda Al Qaeda types, and uh, we will see that in Syria. We'll see uh, perhaps if uh, the, uh, the the extremists uh, gain some territory and uh, and to plan to launch attacks on uh, on west on the west or its allies. We might see uh, drones coming in uh, as we see in Yemen. They're, they're, Al Qaeda will be fought by multiple fronts, by both the local population and the international community. The uh, one thing that we forget we forget to to add as a caveat in this, or at least context, is the fact that the uh, the Syrian regime has the, has infiltrated Al Qaeda more so than any other um, country in the world. And it was a most, it was launched in the beginning by a, by a man called Mustafa Al Tajir, who is now dead. Um, he died of old age, or, or some people say they killed him. Somebody killed him, and he was the head of the military intelligence. There, there have been links even after September 11th. I spoke to a um, a uh, member of parliament in in Aleppo, and uh, he told me that he went to Afghanistan. This is a, this is in December 2000, 2001, and he went to Afghanistan to speak to the Taliban, to speak to Mullah Omar, to to surrender Osama bin Laden, who he called a sheikh. <laughs> at the time, and and you know he he he, he said he treated him with some deference. So there there, there have been these links. Okay. How will it play out in the future? We don't know for sure, but I think there will be fought. I think Chrissy's on mute. 
Sorry, the Syrian me regime. Yeah. So that. Uh, <laughs> I, I love putting myself on mute. Apparently, um, you know what? What I was hearing. Sorry, sorry, but. <laughs> Are we having problems? Go on ahead. Sorry. So oh, okay. Um, no, we're here. Yeah. So we you know, you. from the beginning, when okay, 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 good, good, good. Um, so from the beginning, you know, um, on the ground, it sounded like you know the rebels were they were people who were fighting for their lives, you know, just just for their livelihood, for their families, and everything. And now, you know, you have something like the ceasefire and. How I always explain it, or how is it was it was explained to me, was when you're when you're drowning and you're reaching out to your allies and asking them to help you, and they're not helping you, and the people who are willing to help you with the money are, you know, um, other terrorist organizations or foreign fighters. You know, you're you're probably going to take help from them, and so that's what we're seeing. And even uh, when the ceasefire was declared. Um, El Nusra stepped up and said, "Hey, there's not going to be any ceasefire." You know, it, we're we're going to continue to fight. So that was kind of the first sign that that okay, this is possibly not going to work. So uh, you know what happens in the end if if they there's probably definitely going to be a fight again against um, you know this is our community we we don't want the foreign fighters in here. But who knows? You know these people are also helping them. So it'll be interesting to see how they actually establish you know a, a civil community. Mike, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I think. Can I can I just just mention something uh, which is ho hopefully further the conversation from um, week to week? And uh, I just want to a plug really for ourselves, and that's just to say that um, new new this week uh, completely is having the the live player. There's a still there um, with Mohammed. Um, Everything will be on the, the Google event page, and what we're hoping is that this will be an education. I, I can play it, just shall take him off now. Um, to say that we've not only got the Syria Deeply, uh, sorry, Syria Saturday hashtag, but we want to make as many resources available whatsoever from the moment this broadcast ends to next Saturday. So we've got a full seven days. And one of the lovely things I'd like to do this week is open up a Google moderator so people can submit their own questions. and just absolutely push it out. So the moment this broadcast ends, we've got 20, so I was going to say 24 hours every day until next week or so. This is a lot of hours anyway. I'm just, just plugging the, the show, that's all, Laura. <laughs> Mike, it's awesome. We called you the grandmaster well, flags of Google Hangouts for, for a reason. <laughs> and and he is the grandmaster. <laughs> Well, I, I think that the yeah, thing that he's teaching I'm us all to, how it gets done. Yeah, it's great. is, it is people forget that um, if we've got this hashtag and we've got these platforms, it's all platforms. One of the things I was saying is that people don't realize is that I like to forget about Google Plus altogether and say we've got a lot of conversation in microblogging at Twitter, and that can just literally catapult over Google Plus and arrive live at YouTube, which is phenomenal. And I do know that when this broadcast ends, we're going to have you know a lot more viewers throughout the week because we'll push it out in the right places for the right reasons. And on that note, on Twitter, we've gotten two questions about Turkey that I want to talk to Christy way. It's basically sort of how serious Turkey and how um. You're you're breaking up, so I I'm sorry I can't I couldn't hear the question. So it's probably okay. somebody who's on Twitter you already. Out, but I'll put it in the window as Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I can't. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Yeah, Lara does speak many, many languages. It's all right. Yes, I yes, I, I think that. Um, so, so the question. <laughs> I'm Irish. Um, so the question. Still no. Okay, I'm gonna type it out. I'm typing it out. How does Syria affect Turkey now, and what happens breaks up into smaller pieces? Is that a thing? Is there kind of a strategic play for Turkey around? And in Kurdistan, around more flexibility to play in the north. 
Oh, I, I'm okay, so sorry. Yeah, how about, I actually understood the question, uh, Christy. The, uh, the question was, That's right. what, are, what are the uh, strategic, <laughs> yeah, what are the strategic plays for Turkey uh, in terms of a, uh, a, a breakup or a split in Syria, and would they want to see Syria re remain intact, or are they worried about the, uh, the existence of, uh, of a, a, perhaps an Alawite state that would, uh, that would be an enemy to Turkey, or um, a, Kurd, a, a free Kurdish area that would also link into Iraq and, and perhaps push the Turkish Kurds into uh, wanting more autonomy? Hmm. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's obviously a very, very complex question because yes, you definitely have the divided areas. Uh, like, um, there's a there's a community now, Afrin, which is primarily a Kurdish community. They're not seeing any of the the um, fighting going on there that you're seeing inside Aleppo. So yes, to have a divided communities, it's it's very possible. Now, Turkey. I mean, what I've heard from from um, other resources is that you know if you're if you want a role model Turkey is probably the role model if you want democracy to go by uh, in the Middle East I mean they they you know um, they have a democracy here so and they also you know it's I wouldn't believe it's in Turkey's best or interest to let Syria uh, fall I mean they're they need to have that stability there I mean Syria, Syria sits right on the uh, they have a lot of ports that's important and uh, between Turkey and Syria they used to have prior to the revolution they ha used to have a lot of um, people who were crossing both ways they did business so financially it's very very important for them to keep that bond between the two countries I hope that answered the question because I, I you know I was trying to there were there was a lot of, a lot there <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a complex question is Laura back now I'm I'm not so sure she is. Okay. Well, I think. Do you guys hear me now? You got me. Go ahead. Yes, better, better, much better. <laughs> we hope. You got me. It's fabulous. <laughs> so uh, I think the part of the the root of that question. We hope. Well, I think she dropped again. Yeah. Well, to, call, to be honest, Mohammed. yeah, it is my call, and I think we we, we usually try to keep these uh, programs around uh, thirty minutes. We went a bit over today. I'd like to to thank uh, Setting Mirzavan, uh, Mike Downs, Chrissy Wilcox, and of course uh, Lara, um, who is uh, having some uh, connection problems, but she uh, she will be back uh, stateside soon for uh, Syria Deeply. I'm Mohammed Serchi. Thank you for joining us.